Good morning. Welcome to Pleasant View. Let's stand up and worship the Lord together. Take a minute and greet the people around you.
This I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. Thy 
Thank you. You may be seated. That's beautiful. At this time, we're going to dis dismiss our kids, age kindergarten through third grade, to class of design specifically for them. So kids, you can make your way out the back doors, and we're thrilled to have them with us. Um, my name is Jason. I am, uh, I'm one of the pastors here. It's my privilege to welcome you to Pleasant View. If this is your first time or first couple of times here, we hope you've already been made to feel welcome, and uh, we are thrilled that you're here. There's a Connect card in the seat back in front of you, or you can grab it digitally uh, by scanning the QR code that's there. We'd love to meet you officially and get to know you, and uh, you can bring your Connect card back to the visitor kiosk in either lobby. We have a gift for you there. We're grateful that the Lord has brought you to us today. Just wanted to update you on how the parking lot fundraising project is going. We are over a third of the way there. Oh, look, I forgot a comma. Um, that's okay. Uh, we are over a third of the way there, nearly $110,000 raised. Thank you so much. That is, an, that is a not insignificant amount of money that has been given by you to the church for the maintenance of what God has entrusted to us here we're just about a third of the way to our goal, and uh, next Sunday had been the, uh, the time that we had set as a kind of a decision-making point as far as will we move forward this summer, what will we do to facilitate that. And so, again, if you are considering what the Lord might be leading you to give towards the parking lot, uh, we would ask that you would give uh, your best gift by next Sunday so that we can make that decision with all the information uh, possible. Also want to let you know, this is the last Sunday to sign up for the women's brunch that is happening um, on May 11th. And so if you have not yet signed up for that, please do so. You can do it on the app. You can do it on the website. You can also stop by and say hi to our ladies at the tables right now after service and get your tickets for that. And then lastly, we are two months away from VBS. I just had a little bit of a shudder of fear go down my spine. There is so much to do, and we need so many people on that team to help us make it awesome. And so uh, if you are going to be in town on the week of June 24 to 28, we would love to have you on the team that puts that on and blesses children in our community uh, with the message that the Word of God is reliable and faithful and steady, and they can build their lives upon it. So with that, we're going to have uh, Ralph come up and lead us in prayer. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Father, we come into your presence this morning in awe of who you are. We just observed when we look at creation, the greatness of what you have done. When we look at the turmoil in the world around us, we see how much we need you. We don't have the answers to bring peace on earth, but we know the Prince of Peace. And so we come this morning to worship him, for he is worthy of our worship. And Father, we pray that you would accomplish your will in the midst of the turmoil, that your greatness, your holiness would be evident to all peoples around the world as you accomplish your purposes that they may know that you are Lord and worship you, that you might receive the glory that you deserve. And Father, we pray for your people around the world, many of whom are suffering for your namesake. Lord, we pray that you would provide for their needs, that you would strengthen them to stand firm in the midst of their turmoil. Father, we pray that they would be faithful to you and that you would be glorified through them. We pray, Father, that 
for us in the midst of our circumstances, the turmoil in our world, as well as for them, that we might not lose perspective, that we might not lose sight of you, that we might not focus our attention on political parties or persons, but that we would keep our focus on you. And that as we trust you in the midst of uncertain times, we pray that people would see our confidence in you and be drawn to you. So Father, we, we just come into your presence this morning praising you because you are worthy of our praise. We would pray this morning for the Ministry of Child Evangelism Ministries, uh, for the... Uh, for Steve and his wife as they lead that ministry, as they prepare for a summer of active fair ministry and five-day clubs and other ways, Lord, we pray that you would provide the personnel they need to participate in that. We pray that you would guide them. We pray that children and whole families would be drawn to you as a result of that ministry. We think of those who are struggling with illnesses right now. Uh, Father, we would, we would pray for uh, Steve and we would pray for Andy. And certainly there are many others who need our prayers today. We would pray for them that you would give their doctors wisdom as they seek to uh, deal with their illness, that you would strengthen them, that you would use their trust in you in the midst of uh, seemingly impossible circumstances use their lives uh, even within hospitals and doctor's offices may people see their confidence in you and be drawn to you through them lord we pray that you would use each of us that way we would take advantage of the opportunities you give us uh, to raise questions or whatever means we might have to share christ with people around us Use us to that end, that people would be drawn to you, that you would be glorified. Now, as we turn to your word this morning, Father, we pray that you would speak to us through Pastor Mike, that he would uh, be able to present clearly the truth of your word, that your spirit would take that truth and apply it to our hearts, and that we would go out transformed because we've been with you. Use us to encourage one another and to glorify you. And we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. One of my favorite movies, I've shared this in the past, is uh, a movie by the name of The Family Man. This plays a lot of times around Christmas time. It, it uh, takes place around then, and uh, Nicolas Cage plays this actor named Jack, and he gets a glimpse of what his life would have been like had he made a different decision many years earlier as he was uh, deciding whether or not to travel overseas to take an internship for business or to just marry his, his fiance at the time, and in their minds, he was certain that he would do this internship, it would be great for him, he would come back, they'd get married, and they would live happily ever after, and she was concerned that if he went, that somehow their relationship would dissolve and it wouldn't work out, and she ended up being right, he ended up going on that internship, and so he gets this look at what his life would have been like otherwise, and um, what you see in the story is that, that that one decision as they're standing there in the airport and she's trying to beg him, just don't go. I just don't feel good about this. I just don't think this is right. And he's trying to convince her, look, we've thought about this. This is the right thing to do. In the story, it's very clear that becomes a turning point in his life. That the decision that he made then had a whole bunch of ramifications and his life turned out in a whole bunch of different ways very specifically because of that decision. And then the story, you get the opportunity to see what it would have looked like had he made the other decision, had he not gone. And, and you see all these things in his life that are different, that, that turn out way differently because of that one decision. And in essence, in the story here in Acts chapter 13, where we find ourselves, we find ourselves in the midst of a turning point. 
specifically a turning point for the Jews as a nation, but it's, it also involves individuals who are making a particular decision about Jesus. And as a result of the decision they're making, there is this turning point that is taking place that will have a significant effect, not only on these Jews, but on many of their descendants to come. And in verse 46 in particular, this is kind of the, verse 46 is kind of lands near the climax of this chapter, but just to kind of get a sneak peek, it says, and Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly saying, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, to the Jews. But since you have thrust it aside and have judged yourselves or judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. This is this turning point. This turning point for the Jews who had been the ones to first receive the gospel, to always, in every place Paul would, and Barnabas would go, they were the first to hear. They were kind of given priority status. They were given pole position. They were given first opportunity and and. Many of them along the way just continually reject, say, no, thank you. Sometimes it's not even a thank you. And so the warning that is coming here is that a turning point is about to happen. What we're going to see in the book of Acts is this becomes a turning point as well in the book of Acts. Up till now, the church has been essentially a Jewish, uh, has a very Jewish look to it. It's primarily full of Jewish people, and you'll have Gentiles speaking. Um, scattered throughout a little bit, but it's predominantly a Jewish entity of the church and, uh, and some Gentiles scattered in. And what we'll see is in the book now, it's going to become, the, the, the church is going to grow to become something that is predominantly a Gentile thing with some Jews sprinkled in the mix. And, and so, you know, you'd be asking yourself why, and this chapter helps to explain that. It helps to emphasize this turning point that takes place where the Jews have been given a lot of chances and the bulk of those who were going to respond have already responded. And now essentially you've got those that were inclined to believe amongst the Jews who have already turned to Jesus and received him as Messiah and then everybody else. And so this morning, if you have an outline, you'll notice there's no points to fill in. This is one of those chapters that as I've wrestled with it. It, it doesn't really seem to lend itself as much toward, toward a formal outline, but we're going to just work through it, and I'm really going to camp near the end, which is where the, the, the main emphasis is, I believe, in this passage. But um, if you have your Bibles, turn there to Acts 13. If not, you can follow along on the screen, but we're going to begin in verse 13. This picks up from last week. Last week began Paul's, what's typically referred to as his first missionary journey. Some see this as a second or even a third based on some other trips that he took. But most would see this as the first missionary journey. And um, anyways, it's picking up there in the midst of this journey, starting in verse 13. It says, now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and they came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. This is John Mark. We saw him back in verse 5. Once again, he's just sort of mentioned, and then he's not brought up again in the story. Verse 14, but they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and they sat down. Now, again, if you were here last week, you saw the map that I showed you that, that kind of begins the missionary journey. They started over there in Antioch. They went down to the, to the island of Cyprus and uh, went throughout that island from uh, Salamis on the eastern side all the way to Paphos on the west. And that's where our story picks up. They left Paphos and sailed up to Perga. And then from Perga, they traveled north a little further to Antioch. And specifically, it says it's Antioch of Pisidia because this is a different Antioch from the one where they started. And so there's, there's two different Antiochs. Uh, they start in Antioch. They end in Antioch. That's just a coincidence. But so this is where they're traveling from. And once again, in verse 14, on the Sabbath day, they go into the synagogue where they sit down. This is Paul and Barnabas's um, uh, modus operandi. This is typically what they do. They go into a new town. They visit the synagogue on Sabbath. It gives them an opportunity to talk about Jesus, to talk about the scriptures, to a listening audience and, and get the, the discussion of the gospel started. So that's what they do here as well. 
Verses 15 and 16, he says, After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, this is Paul and Barnabas, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand, he said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. Again, I mentioned last week, I don't mean to keep repeating that, but last week we saw they go into the synagogues. When they're in the synagogues, because Paul is a trained um, former Pharisee as a visitor in their synagogue, it was, it was uh, typical and expected that he would be given an opportunity to get up and speak if he would like to and address the group. And so Paul takes advantage of that. He stands up and he, he addresses them. And this is significant and this is really easy to miss. But notice how he addresses them at the end of verse 16. He says, men of Israel and you who fear God. Now, at first glance, it would be really easy to see that and assume that he's talking about the same group of people with two descriptions. These are men of Israel who happen to fear God. But that's almost certainly not what he's doing. You see, in the synagogues at this time, you would have, especially throughout the more Gentile world, like outside of Jerusalem and Judea, you would have had in the synagogues Jews, biological Jews, and then you would have others who were Gentiles who had become very interested in the Jewish scriptures and the God of Judaism and had begun to worship that God as Gentiles. This was a phenomenon that was quite common, and they were known as God-fearers. And what we see here is that Paul is specifically addressing the fact that he's got two types of people in the synagogue here, and he says in verse 16, men of Israel... And you who fear God, or you God fears. And then again in verse 26, he's going to do the same thing. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, you know, my fellow kinsmen Israelites, and those among you who fear God, those who are the Gentile God fearers. One more time in verse 43, he says, Jews, and you devout converts to Judaism. Now, as converts, these were not proselytes. Proselytes to Judaism went all the way. They got circumcised. They embraced the entirety of the Old Testament law, and essentially they became Jews, religiously speaking, in order to worship Yahweh. The God fears not as much. They wanted to worship God and Yahweh, uh, worship Yahweh as remaining Gentiles, and so they were sort of second class, but they were allowed to come and participate in the synagogue worship services. Uh, this very likely is, is who Cornelius was. Uh, earlier, that first Gentile convert who we were told then in that context that he was one who feared God and he tried to live a moral life praying to and worshiping Yahweh, but he was not a Jew. So understand this synagogue is very specifically divided into these two types of, of people, the Jews and the Gentiles. Verses 17 through 23 goes on. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers. Notice the language of election as it relates to Israel nationally. You were the chosen ones. You, or you could even say you are the chosen ones, Israel. And he made the people, the people of Israel, great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. Talking about the, um, the exodus leading these people out. Verse 18, and for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All of this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king. Of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all of my will. Of this man's offspring, referring to David, of this man David's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. So he very quickly speaks to, to these people in the synagogue and he gives them a very quick overview of their Israelite history in the scriptures, and he comes all the way up to David, and he mentions the promises to David that David would be given a descendant, a Davidite. We know these to become the messianic prophecies, if you would, prophecies about a coming David-like Messiah. 
And he gets right to the point and says, God has fulfilled this. And it's Jesus. Jesus is the one that was spoken about. Now, at the end of there, verse 23, he says, as he promised, again, at first glance, this just looks like a passing reference, but I'm going to suggest to you that this becomes a pretty important theme that we're going to see come up throughout this chapter. This, This theme of God giving prophecies and being true to his word and coming and bringing to pass what he said he would bring to pass. This this becomes important. In fact, I went through, I was going to try to do this, but there's no easy way to put it up on the screen. I've gone through with a pen and and underlined in a particular color every reference to fulfilled or a quoting of a prophecy just to see how often, and it's quite a bit throughout this, this chapter, how often the Old Testament is referenced and referenced to its fulfillment. But it kind of begins right here. Jesus is the fulfillment, ultimately, of the promises made about a son of David or a son of Jesse. Verse 24. Before his coming, referring to Jesus, before Jesus' coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance. Now, this is John the Baptist, Israel's most recent prophet. John the Baptist had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course his ministry, he said, what do you suppose that I am? I am not he, no, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Now again, right off the bat here, I think what he is pointing to is the fact that John the Baptist, your most recent prophet, he specifically prophesied about Jesus, that right after him was going to come somebody that he, their great prophet, most recently speaking, He was unworthy to even untie this guy's sandals, that that the one coming right after John would be their Messiah. Paul's point is, that was Jesus. It was fulfilled. And yes, most of you missed it. Most of you refused to listen to what John the Baptist told you. Verse 26, brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which they read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. Now again, this is key. This is going to be important later. He's saying, look, the leaders, our recent religious leaders, who ignored John the Baptist's warnings, And they failed to recognize Jesus was the Messiah. In fact, they put him to death. Paul argues they actually fulfilled prophecy about Jesus because they were so dense and unable to understand the very prophets that they read every week. Every Sabbath, they read these prophets. They should have listened to it and understood it, but they were dense. You could read into that. They were stubborn and hard-hearted, and therefore, they actually made themselves fulfillments of the very prophecies And well, they helped to fulfill the very prophecies that they didn't understand. And he's going to go on to show how prophecies said that this Messiah would be rejected and put to death and then raised from the dead. And that the Jewish leaders helped to fulfill God's prophecies. Um, I don't remember where I left off. I think it was 27, verse 28. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, They asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, again, notice they are fulfilling the prophets by their behavior. They took him down from the tree and they laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. He's referring to the prophets. I'm sorry, he's referring to the apostles. He's saying these ones that had been with him, his disciples, who had traveled with him and they witnessed his resurrection and now they, he says, who are now his witnesses to the people, these apostles serve as the ones who say, this really happened. This was true. Verse 32, and we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second psalm. Now he's going to begin to quote some Old Testament prophecies to back up what he's saying, that the prophets had predicted that Jesus would in fact 
or that Messiah, who Jesus was, that the Messiah would in fact be put to death and then ultimately raised back to life. So in Psalm chapter 2, in verse 7, it says, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way. Now we get a quotation from Isaiah 55. It says, I will give you the holy and the sure blessings of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, this is Psalm 16, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep, or he died. And he was laid with his fathers, and he saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. His point is this. Look, in Psalm 16, it's speaking in the context. It seems like he's speaking about David, and he says that God will not allow you to see corruption. And Paul here is making the argument, clearly this didn't refer to David himself because David died and stayed dead and his body corrupted in a grave. So clearly he's saying we should be looking for someone else as the fulfillment of that, a different David character, and that's obviously in a Jewish mindset, the, Jewish, the, the Messiah, the one who would be the son of David, the branch of David. And so he is saying, look, this is Jesus who died and now was risen again, who the apostles give testimony and say, this guy's been risen again. He's saying, look, can't you see how the Old Testament prophets foretold Messiah would be one who would be put to death and then raised back to life? Who else fits that bill but Jesus? This is what he's arguing. Verse 38. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, Jesus, Forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. That is an amazing promise. And in essence, he's, he's contrasting with these Jews, Jesus and what Jesus offers to them versus what they have offered under the Old Testament law. See, for many of them, they're still functioning where the Old Testament law is the source of their morality. And Paul is saying, there's nothing wrong with the Old Testament law. I mean, it's divine. It's been given by God, but it is insufficient to bring about two things for you. It's insufficient to bring about forgiveness of sins, and it's insufficient to bring about freedom from sin. You see, all that the law could do is tell them that they were sinners. All that the law could do is set up rules and said, this is how you should live. And then every time they failed to live it, the law itself couldn't actually do anything about that. Now, in the law, there were, there were uh, ceremonies that would bring about atonement. And so in that sense, it was. But those ultimately pointed to something. The law itself wasn't providing atonement. The law pointed to in its ceremonies somebody else who would bring about forgiveness, and that is Jesus, ultimately. So Jesus is saying, look, if you truly want to be free, if you really want to be forgiven, you need something more than just the Old Testament law. You need, by faith, to embrace Jesus. And great news, it's being offered to you. Verse 39, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. And so they're offered this forgiveness. Verse 40. Now this becomes, I think, the main application, the main challenge in Paul's sermon as he gets up and speaks relatively brief, briefly in the synagogue that day to these Jews and Gentile worshipers of God. Verse 40, he says, Beware, beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Now, just for a second, pause. What does he mean, beware lest it should come about? If it's in the prophets, isn't it guaranteed to come about? And, you know, you could argue there are some prophecies that are conditioned and are conditional, but I don't think that's what he's getting at here. He says, beware lest what is said in the prophets should come about. His point in context is, lest it come about to you specifically. Lest you be found to be individually a fulfillment of something that was said generally. 
that the Old Testament prophets gave some general warnings and general predictions, but as far as you specifically, beware lest you find yourself in this group of people that the Old Testament prophecies predicted generally about. And what is the prediction? Verse 41. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. That's really a, a grouping together of a, of a uh, prophecy from Habakkuk chapter 1, as well as another one from Isaiah 29. And essentially in those prophecies, there is warning given to Israel that many of them were about to, to have judgment come upon them. Why? Because of their hard-hearted, stubborn rebellion against God, their refusal to believe the things that are being said to them. And even though God is sending his prophets to them and directly confronting them and telling them, this is what's going to happen, you must repent, so many of them refuse to believe the prophets. And what Paul is saying to the people in his day is, look, these same promises could be true of you depending on how you respond. That this general prophecy about Jews who refuse to believe and who scoff at God's word, that could be you. You better beware and make sure that it isn't. And how do you beware to make sure it isn't? You respond to the invitation with faith. That's the essence of what he's saying. Verse 42, as they went out, so now the people, the, the, the sermon's over. People are leaving the synagogue. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told to them the next Sabbath. So they're very excited to hear this. They're, they're interested in what Paul said. And they want to be told more the following week. Verse 43, and after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. Now, this is important too. So you have these Jews and these Gentile God-fearers who were preached to that day by Paul and Barnabas. Paul gave a very messianic, Jesus-oriented Christian gospel to a bunch of Jewish people. And their initial response is, I'm really interested in that. I want to learn more. That sounds intriguing, Please, please come back next week, Paul, and, and give us more. I, I want to think about this. I want to hear more so I can make a good decision about this. And Paul's response to them is, that's good. Please continue in this grace of God. He urges them to continue in the grace of God. In other words, they have received the grace of God as Paul's message, the word of God, has spoken to them. And this grace of God is doing a work in them because they are interested. They are wanting to hear more. They are beginning initially to respond to this gospel. And they're saying, yes, this sounds good. I'm interested. I want to hear more. You might say they have demonstrated an element of being a seeker of good things, a seeker of God's word. They've, they've demonstrated interest, and Paul is saying, okay, but you need to continue this positive reception to the gospel. This isn't enough just to have interest. You need to continue pursuing in this grace of God and not, and not let it be a one-off, well, that was interesting, now I'm going to go do something else. <clears throat> Verses 44 and 45, the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Now, I think this has to be hyperbole. Uh, this is a bit of an exaggeration, but it's a way of saying a whole bunch of people came out. These people went home, and not only did they be sure to return the next day, but they invited their neighbors and friends. The people began to talk to other people about this amazing message that Paul had shared with them that, that the Messiah actually has already shown up and that it was Jesus and that when he was put to death and then these rumors about him being raised back to life, that's actually fulfillment of prophecy. And so a whole bunch of people turn out and as we're going to see, the majority of them are Gentiles. A whole bunch of people, especially the Gentile neighbors and, and friends, show up that next day to hear more about this. Verse, four, verse 45, but when the Jews saw the crowds, they, the Jews, were filled with jealousy and they began to contradict what was spoken by Paul 
reviling him. So many important things in this one verse. The Jews saw the crowds. What is it about the crowds that sets them off? It doesn't tell us, but it's the implication is it's a bunch of Gentiles. They, they see this whole huge group of Gentiles who are like, oh, we're excited. We want in on this. We want to be a part of this. This is for us. And the Jews were struck with jealousy. Why are they struck with jealousy? Well, I mean, this was kind of their thing. You know, this was their religious uh, teaching. This was, they were the chosen ones. Remember earlier and Paul's you know, lecture, how he talks about them as being God's chosen ones, uh, the ones that, that uh, back in verse 17, the God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers, and they took a lot of pride in that. Their sense of being God's chosen ones, their sense of, of we are the ones that received the inheritance. We are the ones who are given this land. And it seems like they were okay with some, a few Gentiles sprinkled in, kind of you know, being a part of them. I mean, frankly, that's not all that different from the Old Testament. You would have Gentile converts to, to Judaism, and, and they were okay with that. But it seems like this prospect of being overrun by this huge crowd of predominantly Gentiles has caused something in them to say, wait a minute, this is not Judaism. This is not what, what we're, we're not comfortable with this. And so they're struck with this internal sense of this can't be right. I have got to fight this. I have got to resist this. And so it's, that's what they do. They begin to contradict what was spoken by Paul. They begin to argue with him. They begin to debate with Paul. They begin to try to point out flaws in what he said and tell him he's wrong. And they're trying to dissuade the audience from going along with Paul. In fact, they even revile him and mock him. Now, this is pretty important because, again, just looking, look back in your Bible to verse 41, and what was the warning that he gave them? What was the, what was the beware? Lest your behavior brings about the prophecy on you, that you become the fulfillment of your own prophecies. Specifically, verse 41, they were called scoffers, and here we see that they're reviling Paul and Barnabas. And that... They're, God's doing a work in their days, a work in which they will not believe. They're doing the very thing Paul warned them about. Paul said, don't, beware lest you become the fulfillment of your own scripture's prophecies, that you become one of these scoffers who refuses to believe and thus who will end up perishing and missing out on eternal life. And what we see is that they are, in fact, bringing that about by their behavior. Verse 46, after this all happens, Paul and Barnabas spoke, and bo spoke out boldly saying, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. But since you thrust it aside, and since you judge yourselves to be unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Oh, here's another prophecy of yours that he's going to let them know about and remind them of. You remember that prophecy that said that you were to be a light to the Gentiles and that God was going to bring salvation to the ends of the earth? Well, we're going to fulfill that one right now. Now, this is really important and there, one of Jesus' parables seems to just coincide, you know, like two pieces of a puzzle to this event that's taking place here. And it's the parable of the wedding feast, which you can find in a couple places. But Matthew chapter 22, it would be the main one that I would point out, just as far as some points of comparison. I'm not going to read that whole parable for time's sake, but in Matthew 22... Verses 1 through 14, you have the story of a king who has a wedding that is being planned, and he has sent out invitations to all of the, the people, the friends, the relatives, the, the, the people who were close. And he basically says, look, you know, come on the appointed day. Well, the day comes, and he sends the, the messengers out and says, go let them know that the feast is here, the fatted calf is, is cooked, and, and I'm ready for them to come, and, and they just ignore him. Like all of these messengers go out. And they come back and they say, well, no one's responded. No one's coming. So he sends them out a second time. And a second time, they, they just ignore the invitation. In fact, this time it says some went to their business, some went to their farm, and some even significantly mistreated and even persecuted or attacked the messengers who were sent out. And they come back again. These people haven't responded. And so now the king is angry 
And he says, go out into the highways, go out into the ditches, go out into the back streets, and just invite anyone and everyone who is willing to come and, and invite them to come on in, including the lame and the blind, you know, the, the people that you wouldn't typically think would get invited to the feast. And so they do that, and a whole bunch of them respond. They feel privileged. They feel excited that they would be given this invitation, and so they respond, and they come. And then there's this switch there a little bit in the parable where one of the individuals who shows up is not wearing the proper wedding garment, which would have been provided by the host, and he's confronted. It's like, what are you doing not wearing the proper, the proper garment? And so he is cast out of the wedding feast into outer darkness, and then it's the language of, of hell where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What you see in, in, in Matthew 22, it's interesting, is there's this statement in verse 8 that says, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. They were not worthy. Why weren't they worthy? Because they refused to come. Because even though they had been invited, and this wedding had been prepared for them in particular, they said, no, thank you. And some of them wasn't even a thank you. It was a beat up the messengers who came with the offer and said, get out of here and essentially mocked and reviled them. So they were not worthy. And you get that same language here in verse 46 where it talks about these Jews who have judged themselves unworthy of eternal life. And so what you see, the parable seems pretty obvious that the, the initial ones who are invited are the Jews. His parable was meant to look, as he gives it to the Jews, he's showing the Jews that many of you are rejecting the very gospel that was yours to begin with. It was your message. It comes from your scriptures. And many of you, for various reasons, have ignored it and refused to come. And so it, there's this turning point where he says, I'm going to go, and I'm going to go into the highways and byways and, and gutters and, and homeless encampments, and I'm going to invite all the people you wouldn't think would come, and they're going to replace you in the in the kingdom, in essence. They're, they're going to come and, and participate in this thing that you have rejected. And then at the very end, he gives a statement in verse 14. For many are called, but few are chosen. And again, in this parable, at least, it's pretty clear. The, the idea of many are called means the invitation was given to many, but few are chosen. And it's very clear in this context, at least, that the chosen are those who chose to respond. That those who respond are referred to as the chosen. And again, in a context with Israel versus the, the, the Gentiles, I think the idea is the Jews would have assumed they were the chosen irregardless of how they responded. And Jesus in his parable is saying, if you don't respond, you're not the chosen. In fact, the ones who do respond are the chosen. You're simply the called. Now this leads us to verse 46, because verse 46 is a bit of a debated verse, but it's central to where Paul is climaxing in this um, discussion and, and sermon with the Jews on the second week, the second Sabbath that he's there. Sorry, verse 48 is what I meant to say. I said 46. Verse 47, I already read, For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you, the Jews, a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles, in verse 48, heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. They were excited about the Old Testament prophecies because the Old Testament prophecies said, you're invited too. That the Jews ultimately were to be a light to the Gentiles and that this gospel was to go and penetrate to the ends of the earth. And the Gentiles hearing this begin rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And it says, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Now, this verse is central particularly to a debate that oftentimes is, is couched um, in the, the, the language of the doctrine of what is known as Calvinism. Some would, would contrast that with Arminianism. There are plenty of people who do not claim to be Calvinists who do not also claim to be Arminians, and so I prefer to use Calvinist and non-Calvinist. But essentially, every... every um, Orthodox Christian believer who studies the scriptures understands that the Bible talks both about God doing a work and being involved in the process of salvation and working in the hearts of the people that are responding. And then there's also a human response of some sort that people are called to believe, to trust, to respond. 
and again, this is overly simplified. I realize that. I hope it doesn't feel too simplified. But just for those who aren't familiar with the terms, the idea of a Calvinist generally is one who puts priority on God's work in that process, that they believe that at the end of the day, ultimately what makes the difference between those who are saved and those who aren't is the work of God, and that those who aren't saved or those who are saved is because God chose for them to be or he didn't choose for them to be saved. And those who aren't Calvinists generally do say the opposite. They say, yes, we see both of these things at work, but at the end of the day, the, the stress, the, the ultimate why a person is or isn't saved comes down to the human decision to, to accept or reject that. Now, depending on your theological assumptions, and, I, and I'll just say as well, in our church, we don't divide over that issue intentionally. We have very intelligent, good people who love scripture, who are careful students of God's word, who land on both sides of that controversy in our church. And, and frankly, we think that's a good thing, that, that, that's, that, that, uh, that this is not a, a, an issue that Christians need to divide over. But as we look at it here, then how do we understand the specific reference to as many as were appointed to eternal life believed? Well, one way to understand that is to understand it in a more Calvinistic sense, and it's probably the more obvious way to see it if you just read it the way it's usually translated. As many as were appointed, the assumption is were appointed by God to eternal life, that there's sort of this uh, historic choosing of some to believe or to, to have eternal life, that they then are the ones who believe. And so there's this precedent of God's choosing followed up by individuals responding in faith. And there are even some, in fact, there's one commentator in particular who's quite well known who is an Arminian, uh, and he seems to lean more towards that sort of an interpretation of this verse. He, he references that at the very least it emphasizes God's sovereignty in the role of salvation. That's how he understands this reference. So that is one possible way to understand it. It's maybe the easier one to understand. There is another way that this can be understood that some scholars take, and that is to see this appointing not as something that God is doing, but that it is something that the individual is doing for himself, in which case they typically wouldn't use the word appointed as the best uh, translation here. This gets a bit deep. Try to follow along. I usually I try not to make things or get into the weeds, but this is one of those where it requires a little bit of that. So in Greek, like English, if you remember back to your days in elementary grammar, you might remember in English, verbs have active voice or passive voice. Active voice is the subject of the sentence is doing the action to an object. So I love my spouse. I as the subject am loving my spouse, that's active, active voice. If it was a passive voice, it would say something like, I am loved by my spouse. I, the subject, am being acted upon by the object, my wife. Now, Greek has both of those, but then they have a third category, which is known as the middle voice. We don't have a, an equivalent in English, but the middle voice in Greek is essentially, I, as the subject, am being acted upon by myself. So typically, if you translate that into English, it's usually translated in an active sense, I do something to myself, or I uh, act in some way upon myself. And the difficulty comes because the middle voice and the passive voice have exactly the same form in Greek. So when you look at it in Greek, the only thing that makes a difference is the context. It looks passive. Some, it's actually referred to as the, the middle passive because it has a passive form, but sometimes in the context, it implies that it should be translated with a middle sense of it. And so this is one of those places where there's debate. There are some who look at this and says, I think this is supposed to be a middle voice here where the person, the, the appointing is something that the individual that is being appointed is actually doing themselves. They are appointing themselves, or again, they don't usually use the term appoint. It's the Greek word tasso, which has a range of ways to, 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 to um, translate it. And this is just an example of it in Acts 15 too. The exact same Greek word tasso, depending on which New Testament translation you look at, uh, Paul and Barnabas were appointed to go up to Jerusalem 
or in the Holman Christian Standard, the church arranged for Paul and Barnabas to go up, or in the New American Standard, King James, New King James, the brethren themselves determined that Paul and Barnabas would go up, and then finally the church decided. And so it's a Greek word that can imply something. It's the idea of to put oneself in order, to order oneself. It's oftentimes used in military context of, of rank or getting in, in line with. So when the, the commanding officer says to do something, the people get in line or somebody else puts them in line. It's used in, in Romans in the opposite. It's a, it's a word that's basically like anti-tasso in Greek, uh, where it's the passage about God establishes the government uh, to be authorities and ministers, and those who resist the government, they anti-tasso the government. So in some sense, the word can take on this idea of to put oneself in line with, to submit oneself to, to, to place oneself under in a submissive way and to get in line, or some would translate it then to dispose oneself toward what another person is saying. So one Greek teacher, for, well, he's been a Greek teacher in the past. His name is Dr. Bob Wilkin. Uh, he says it this way. He takes this, this view. He says, the word appointed here means in certain situations to put or to place troops in military terms. And here it's used in the middle passive voice. And so it could well mean something like as many as had positioned themselves in relation to eternal life believed. Or we could even loosely translate it as many as were open to eternal life they believed. And essentially, he'll go on uh, in the place where, I've, where you would take his, his view on this to do what many, even on both sides of this debate, will acknowledge is that there's a clear and intentional contrast going on in this passage between the Jews and the Gentiles, as my chart demonstrates. In verse 46, you see the Jews who refuse to believe, and in verse 48, you have a statement about the Gentiles who choose to believe. In verse 46, the Jews thrust it aside. They thrust the word of God aside. In other words, they had a reaction to the word of God, and it was no. The Gentiles, in verse 48, were told, honored and glorified God's word. They, have, they also have a response to God's word, but it's a receptive response. And then thirdly, in verse 46, we're told that the unbelieving Jews, quote, judged themselves unworthy of eternal life, whereas the Jews were appointed unto eternal life. And so there's some contrast going on here, including about their attitudes of eternal life. Those who take this second way of seeing it says from the context, the Jews judge themselves in a certain way as unworthy of eternal life. Now, this cannot be taken in a precisely literal fashion. It's not as though the Jews were standing around saying, you know, I don't, I don't think I'm worthy of eternal life, so I think I'm going to not, not believe this. Yeah, me too. I, I, don't, think, I don't think that's for me. We know that's not what's going through their minds. In their minds, they thought they were worthy of eternal life. They're the Jews after all. It's those Gentiles that aren't worthy of eternal life. And so they're resisting it really with the opposite attitude. But what Paul is doing when he's saying they judge themselves unworthy, he's saying by your actions this day, you're actually showing that the very opposite of what you think of you is true. It's sort of like if, you know, maybe you've had this situation, especially if, well, Either way, guy or girl, you've had this experience, maybe you're at recess and they're playing pickup for some sports, some, some you know, basketball game or a soccer game, and you know, you have you pick two captains and they're picking and, and you're the very last one to be chosen. And maybe you're an odd number, so whoever gets you is gonna have one more person. And the person whose turn it is to pick you, they're like, Yeah, hey, you go ahead, you can have Mike. We don't need him. Like, that's insulting. And so you make a comment sort of and say something like, huh, I guess you don't want to win today. Or I guess you've determined that you're going to be the loser today. Like you might say something like that as a commentary about their decision of how they've treated you to basically say your decision demonstrates this about you. Now, none of them were thinking that. None of them are thinking, we want to lose, so we're going to send him over. No, they're thinking the exact opposite. You're probably going to get more in the way than help us, so you go over there. But what Paul is doing is he's, his statement is more of a commentary about them than it really is about what's going on in their mind. And so I think we have to be careful about trying to overly force a literal or precise reading of they appointed themselves to eternal life. That's not really the point any more than it's a point that some judge themselves unworthy of eternal life. It says, in essence, he's saying, by your decision of faith today, you just appointed yourself to eternal life. Your decision today has just determined for you that you are among this group of people who are going to enjoy life 
forever for eternity. And unfortunately, you Jews, the decision you just made today, you've just set yourself into a group of people that aren't even going to have eternal life. You're going to fall under the judgment of God. Now, there's even, there's at least even one Calvinist scholar who takes this particular interpretation of this verse. He's an older guy from the 19th century, but Henry Alford who wrote an eight-volume commentary said on New Testament Greek, said this. He said, quote, the meaning of this word, appointed, must be determined by the context. The Jews had judged themselves unworthy of eternal life. The Gentiles, as many as were disposed to eternal life, believed. Then he goes on for several statements to affirm that we know that the certain truths of Calvinism are in fact true, that God is the one who points and elects and so on. But, he says, to find in this text, preordination to life asserted is to force both the word and the context to a meaning which they do not contain. So again, both options have people from the opposite side who think that's probably the right option. So my point is there are legitimate options on either side of this debate, but I think where we come at at the end of this, hopefully you can get a feel for the entire passage, is this. Paul's warning is... Don't you allow these prophecies general to refer to you specifically, and what makes the difference is your decision. Don't you be like the leaders of Jerusalem who ignored John the Baptist and crucified Jesus because they failed to understand and heed the warnings from the prophets. Don't you be that, like that when you fail to heed the warning of the prophet Habakkuk and Isaiah in your refusal to believe and your choice to scoff at and mock the gospel. Frank Turek is a well-known apologist, and he oftentimes, I'll see him interacting in videos, I'll see him interacting with um, skeptics, usually they're college students, and they come up to the microphone and they will... Off, they'll always begin to generally with some sort of an academic argument in favor of atheism or pushing down Christianity. And he'll interact with them and dialogue with them for a while. And about three or four minutes into it, oftentimes he'll say this. He goes, look, I've got a question for you. Just be, be, be completely honest now, all right? And the person will you know, nod and say yes. And he'll say, if Christianity were true, if it were true, would you believe it? And nine times out of ten, the individual, without giving a ton of thought, just responds from their gut. They say, probably not. No. And he says, well, then doesn't that show that your argument isn't really about an intellectual, academic argument? It's really about something else. There's something else there that is causing you to say, I don't want this to be true. And therefore, I refuse to believe that it's true. And you're, you're couching it in intellectual arguments. And oftentimes I've seen in, in the videos and things, the people will stand there and kind of, like, they don't know what to say to that because it's true. They, they latch on to something, and this is exactly what we see here. Why is the crowd suddenly rejecting Paul? We're told why. It's not because intellectually something he has said is no longer seems to be true to them. It's what? They're filled with jealousy because they see all of these Gentiles. And I'm like, wait a minute. We're not sharing this with a bunch of Gentiles Maybe a couple Gentiles, but not all these Gentiles. Something can't be right. And it's an emotional argument. And this just brings me back to where we began, and I'll end like this. What have been the most significant turning points in your life? You know, when you look back over your life, if you've lived very long at all, you look back and you think about what were the significant decisions in your life? Maybe it was that day that you decided to work up the courage, and maybe you were 50-50 on it, but you went ahead and, and decided to get a phone number from that girl because she was really pretty. And, and ultimately, she ends up being your wife. And you think, boy, what if I would have chickened out in that moment? How would my life have changed? Well, you don't know. Maybe it was just somebody that you became friends with in high school, and you're like, you know, in hindsight, we just happened to have a class together, and we happened to sit next to each other, and, and this friend became so influential, maybe really good or maybe really bad influence on your life. And you look back and you realize that was kind of a turning point in my life. Right there, that day, I made that decision. See, some days, sometimes we don't even know that the turning point is happening until a long time later. Maybe it was a choice to take a job or you had to pick a college, a college um, uh, major. And so you just picked something and, and that choice ended up really putting you in a direction of life. Well, here's what I know is that the decision you make about Jesus is the most significant turning point in your life, whatever decision you make. 
If you make that decision at some point in your life to say yes to Jesus, to follow him, to embrace him, to accept that forgiveness, you will look back on it one day from eternity and realize that was the most significant hands-down turning point in my life. And the opposite is also true. If you say no for whatever reason, and again, some people just do it carelessly without thinking it's an emotional thing. It, it's more of a, well, life's kind of fun, or I'll think about that later. One day from eternity, you'll look back if you reject Jesus now, and you'll realize that was the most significant turning point in your life. You know, it's interesting, that movie that I referenced, The Family Man, in the movie, when he's first forced to go back and live for a time as though he had made the other decision, he is convinced that, that this is the wrong decision and the decision I made originally was the right one. I mean, he has to leave his penthouse in New York City to go to this modest house in the suburbs. He's no longer driving his Ferrari. He's driving a temperamental minivan. He's, he's no longer the, the single bachelor having one-night stands with beautiful women. Now he's a dad with kids, one who needs a diaper change, another who needs a breakfast made for her, taking her to, to school in the morning. He's no longer a wealthy CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Now he's a tire salesman, and he hates his life. But after a while, he kind of realizes, you know what? This life is actually way better than the life that I had. It takes him time to realize that and have that perspective. And the truth is, many today who are rejecting Jesus think that their life is great. I'm having so much fun. There's these elements of sin that I enjoy, and I don't really want that life over there because I don't really want to give this stuff up. And it's an emotional decision. And it feels like you're making the right decision now, but I guarantee you what Paul is saying to them, beware lest what is said of the prophet should come about to you one day in, history, in, in the future. You will look back and you will realize, man, I made the wrong decision. This passage calls us not to allow the greatest turning point of your life to become a wrong decision. I hope that you will make the right decision if you haven't already and choose to give your life to follow Jesus. This morning, we have the great opportunity to celebrate what Jesus did in offering that forgiveness to us through communion. The praise team is going to come, lead us in some songs, and use those, those time, that time as we sing those songs to prepare your own hearts to receive communion. Father, Lord, we are thankful for the great offer and the great gift that you gave us in Jesus, the, the offer of forgiveness of sins, of freedom from sin, and its consequences. But I pray if there are people even this morning that are struggling to make the right decision as it relates to their life about whether to follow you, or even maybe as believers here, there's other things they're struggling with and wrestling with, and they know the right thing to do, but they're wrestling to make that decision. I pray that you would help them to, to, to think about the turning point that could be going on even now in their life, that your spirit would help, help them to make that right decision. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and sing together as the elements are passed out.
shameful sin placed on him the hope of every man oh the blood of Jesus washes me oh the blood of Jesus shed for me what a sacrifice that saved my life yes the blood it is my victory a great song to help us to think about the work of Jesus on the cross for us, how it is 
our victory. It's, it's not because I lived well enough this past month and because I measured up. It's not because I, I did enough religious activities throughout my life that God re receives me and accepts me. It's ultimately because of what Jesus did for us. He won that victory on the cross and then ultimately at the grave. He conquered death for us, the penalty for our sins. We would be remiss if we didn't, as Jesus encouraged us regularly, take time collectively as a group to remember his wonderful, amazing sacrifice for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we read, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's do that together this morning in remembrance of him. In the same way also he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's partake together. Father, what a privilege it is to be your children. Many, maybe even all of us in this room are of Gentile descent, and yet as those who were one time outsiders, foreigners to the covenants of promise, You've invited in. You've brought us in through the, the blood of Jesus, through the work and the righteous living of Jesus, a descendant of Abraham, a descendant of David, who kept the law, who fulfilled the Old Testament promises, and has welcomed all of us to come and connect ourselves to him through faith and receive that forgiveness that we too can be amongst your people and your children. And so we celebrate that today. That is our heart's desire to return thanks to you and to acknowledge in humble faith that we have not earned this righteous standing. We are no better than others who are not saved. We are simply forgiven. And we're brought in under the new covenant. Bless us this week, Lord. I pray that those here would leave with that sense of joy regardless of their circumstances, that they would be reminded of who they are in Jesus this week and that they would be reminded of all of the great inheritance and blessings that are theirs in you. Bring joy to their heart and peace to their heart through that, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.